Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with John Singleton, who died recently at the age of 51. John Singleton was an African-American film director, and although he directed several films, one was Head and Shoulders Above the Rest, the 1991 classic Boys in the Hood. He was a Southern California guy, Blair High School, and the film was about South Central and it was the first film to bring some of the issues of inner-city violence and inner-city survival to the mass public. It was essentially a 1930s-type Jimmy Cagney film, but it was updated with great actors, a great story, and the setting of South Central. I want to mention two actors specifically. One was Lawrence Fishburne, who did a great job. John Singleton had met him on the set of Pee-wee's Playhouse. His character, Furious Styles, was a little too much leftist paranoia for me. You know, the CIA brought drugs into the hood. I don't know about that. But he did an excellent job. But I think the guy who carried the movie was Ice Cube. This was his first role. Singleton had met him on the Arsenio Hall show. And let me tell you something. Ice Cube is one great actor. He proved it in this movie, and he's proved it a lot of times since. Watch Ice Cube. If he's in something, he's going to be good. Anyway, here's the trailer for the movie. John Singleton was the youngest person to ever be nominated for Best Director at the Academy Awards, and also the first African American to be nominated for Best Director. He was two years younger than Orson Welles when Orson Welles was nominated for Citizen Kane. I just don't want to see you end up dead. Or in jail, a drunk standing in front of one of these liquor stores. Can you understand that? South Central Los Angeles. A place where drugs, crime, and violence rule the streets. Why is it that there's a gun shop on almost every corner in this community? Why? For the same reason that there's a liquor store on almost every corner in the black community. Why? They want us to kill ourselves. We got a problem here? Can we have one night where there ain't no fight, nobody gets shot? Mama's boy. Something wrong? Something wrong, yeah. It's just too bad you don't know what it is. Trey, what happened? Talk to me. What happened? Oh. Shit just goes on and on, you know. No, don't show, but I don't care about what's going on in the hood. You have to think, young brother, about your future. I want to do something in my life, right? I want to be somebody. You still got one brother left, man. Here's John Sinclair talking about writing the screenplay when he was a film student at USC. In film school, they always say, write what you know. Mm -hmm. And what do I know? I know South Central Los Angeles. So I just started hanging out with Fatback and some of my old folks and then listening to um, NWA and, and ECE's album. And I said, I'm going to make this movie. It's going to be called Boys in the Hood. And I started writing this screenplay. And I, I don't have a computer of my own, so I have to write it in the, the computer lab at USC, which is like a collective, you know, you have like maybe 24 different computers there, and you have one disc, and you write your paper, and you write your paper, you put it on your desk, and then you go print it out somewhere else. Well, I'm writing the screenplay, The Boys in the Hood, on one of the early Microsoft Word programs, because they didn't even have screenwriting programs back then, right? And mind you, when I write, I not only do I write it, but I also improv the dialogue as I write. So I'm saying the dialogue to myself while I'm writing it. And I'm being loud, I'm using profanity, and I'm like, and I'm standing up and standing over it, and people are watching me and stuff. And you know, you're supposed to be really quiet, like it's a library. And so there are people write, writing their dissertations, they're writing papers and stuff. And some guy says to me, Can you keep it down? I'm like, get out of my face. You mind your own damn business. And I just go in my just keep going in my thing, right? And just keep on writing. It's, we were doing it for a class, you know, that had to be as my thesis. Um, script you had to write it you know you had to write a script to get your your degree and so this is the fall of 1989 you had to write it by the spring of 1990 to get your degree 
Well, I wrote it in the fall of 1989, and you know, was, I think my teacher was uh, a woman who actually wrote about screenwriting, Vicki King. She actually does a thing, How to Write a Screenplay. And she says, well, you guys tell me what grade you want, and maybe you'll get the grade, right? And I said, listen, I have no time to come to class. I'm going to write this damn screenplay. I'm going to give it to you, and I want an A, right? <laughs> so like, everybody's sitting in the class, you know, they're writing a room in about why they can't write, why they have writer's block, and everything. I'm writing. I write this screenplay. And I edited it and everything and stuff, right? I come to class. I think I missed three or four classes and stuff, right? And I used to, I, I was the kind of guy, like, you know, I enjoyed, like, you know, scaring the white people, right? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I was that kind of guy. It was cool. Because like, I, I was intimidated. I was the only black dude at the whole school. So I had to intimidate people, right? There's one guy, right? So I'd give them, I, I would bust their chops and stuff, the teacher's chops and said, here, here's my screenplay. Boom. I want an A. You better give me an A. <laughs> she says, Okay, okay, John Singleton, we'll see. We'll see about it, right? So she reads the screenplay, The Boys in the Hood, right? <laughs> and I come back in, I, I just go in, because I'm, I'm now in, in, in the fall of my senior year, and I'm like, I gotta find a job. I, I mean, like, I'm later for school. I gotta, like, be a reader. I gotta, like, you know, try to figure out, you know, what's going on production wise, if I'm gonna be a PA and stuff, right? I don't have time. Loans coming up, right? And so I go back to her, I said, what I get. <laughs> and she says, you got a <laughs> She didn't talk to me about anything that was in the screenplay or anything. She just, you got it. Well, we're going to move on now to Gino Marchetti, who died recently at the age of 92. You know, I've talked about some great defensive ends in football that I've seen. I've talked about Deacon Jones, who was as good as anybody. And we did a podcast on him. And we did a podcast on Doug Atkins from the Bears, who was as good as anybody. But the third guy I'd have to mention is Gino Marchetti from the Baltimore Colts. He's a legend in Baltimore. If Johnny Unitas was the best player on those Baltimore Colts teams of the late 50s, early 60s, that won two championships in 58 and 59, then Gino Marchetti was the best player on the defense, number 89. In fact, he helped them win that greatest game ever played in 1958, the championship game that went into overtime by tackling Frank Gifford on a key third down that allowed the Colts to get the ball back and have Johnny Unites work his magic to tie and then win the game in overtime. He broke his leg on that play, but he wouldn't leave the field until he saw what the outcome of the game was. Here's a report on the person that many consider the first great defensive end. In 1952, Gino Marchetti began his career as a rather average offensive lineman. Colt head coach Wee Bubank moved him to the other side of the ball, and the NFL's first great defensive end was unleashed. Marchetti used his knowledge as a blocker and became unblockable. Here he comes from the left against Green Bay, and does he pulverize Bart Stump? He's 6'4", 246 pounds, and today that's, you know, a decent size for an outside linebacker. They called him Gino the Giant because he was... One of the biggest people in the league. Look, Chuck, Jim Taylor wants the ball. I think Mr. Taylor changed his mind, wouldn't you? My vision of Gino is flying around the end, shirt tail flying, uh, jumping over a fallen body that he just threw, and a quarterback's eyes getting about that big. That's my picture of Gino. If you look at the film on him, he's always flying around the end. I mean, he's not bull rushing very much, although he could. He was quick, he had great athleticism, and he'd shed you, he would just throw you. Here's a fine close-up look at number 89. Watch him as he moves one way, and now pops back into the hole to stop the joint pullback Petrosati dead in his tracks. There's a great story about Gino. They were playing in San Francisco, and the guy opposite him was Bob St. Clair, who was a college teammate at the University of San Francisco, and currently in the Hall of Fame. And when the game was over, Gino was walking off the field. The Colts won. He had obviously played a great game. And he heard these footsteps and somebody yelling at him coming from behind. And he looked over. It was St. Clair chasing him. And he thought, for some reason, St. Clair wanted to hit him. And St. Clair came up, put his hand on his shoulder, and he said, I just want to say I touched you once today. Never laid a hand on him. You know, unfortunately, we can't support his career by statistics. I didn't even keep sacks. I didn't even come close to keeping sacks. I've been asked the most sacks I've had in one game. I know I've had nine. It's a great feeling because it was a challenge. I mean, one-on-one, -on -one, feel like, man, I got him. I got him. Gino the Giant unloads on quarterback Jim Minowski for a safety and two points. Marchetti fought in the Battle of the Bulge at age 17. 
When he broke his leg in the Colts' 1958 championship game, he refused to be taken to the locker room and remained on the sideline until victory was assured. Gino was a giant. He was the real-life version of the John Wayne characters. He was strong and silent, just this towering presence. The most beloved player on the team was Gino McKay. Everybody, Everybody here tonight. About about three 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 Gino Marchetti was also famous in Baltimore because he was a part owner of Gino's, which was a sort of a fast food restaurant in the late 50s and in the 60s. Before there was McDonald's, they sold hamburgers that were quite good. And before there was Kentucky Fried Chicken, the only outlet where you could get Kentucky Fried Chicken in Baltimore was at Geno's. So you had people from all over coming to patronize Geno's with pictures of number 89, Gino Marchetti, all over the place. And I would be remiss if I didn't play a Geno's commercial because one of their spokesmen was Milton Supman, otherwise known as Soupy Sales. And anytime we get a chance to play Soupy Sales on this show, we're going to do it. That sounds like my pole now. Oh, Archie! Oh, Archie! The British are coming. Oh, no, you don't. I'm not cooking for all those guys. You can just take them to Gino's. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oh, <laughs> it's your old friend, Soupy Sales. And you want to know why everybody goes to Gino's? Well, it's because of all the good food you get there, like all beef hamburgers and Gino Giants and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Thick Giant Milkshakes and mm -mm, the French Fries. And it's because Gino's is the place for the whole family. You know, Gino Sparkles, the place, the food, and the people, too. <laughs> Listen, Horsey, you go to Gino's and get your own hamburger. Well, we're going to move on to entertainment and make a brief mention of Peter Mayhew, who died recently at the age of 74, the British-born actor who starred as Chewbacca in the Star Wars series. Here's Matthew Bannister from the BBC4 Last Word on Peter Mayhew. Peter Mayhew was 7 feet 3 inches tall, which made him a natural choice to play the character of Chewbacca in the Star Wars films. He appeared as Harrison Ford's giant hairy sidekick in the original trilogy, then fought his way back from knee surgery to reprise the role in the prequel Star Wars The Force Awakens. Chewbacca's voice wasn't Peter's. It was built up by the sound designer from recordings of walruses, lions, camels, tigers, bears, rabbits and badgers. Peter recalled how he was cast in the role of Chewbacca by the director George Lucas. The door opened and George walked in. So naturally, what did I do? I am raised in England. As soon as someone comes in through the door, I stand up. George goes, hmm and said, I think we found him. <laughs> Tree transformed me. <laughs> the attitude was different. The walk was different. Uh, get in there, you big boy! Uh, I what you smell! Do the scenes, come back, take the mask off. Peter was back. Chewing. We're home. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. We're going to close with a brief mention of Jo Sullivan Lesser, who died recently at the age of 91. She was the wife of the great Broadway composer Frank Lesser and sort of the guardian of his tradition. Frank Lesser divorced his first wife, Lynn. She wasn't supposed to be a nice person, and the joke was she was the evil of two lessers. He married Jo Sullivan, who was in the production of his musical from 1956, The Most Happy Fellow about a romance between an older man and a younger woman. He was nominated for a Tony in 1957 for that role. He died tragically young in 1969, but as I said, she kept his legacy alive. And as a final tribute, we're going to play one of her songs from The Most Happy Fellow, for which she was nominated for a Tony. It's called Somebody Somewhere. Somebody. 